Greetings, fellow nerds. In this video, we're going to use titration to find the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. So, after decades of experiments on this channel, we're finally going to do what most chemists are actually paid to do, analytical chemistry. Or as my former students would like to call it, analytical chemistry. So I'm going to throw at you a lot of terms really fast, and I'll just be skimming over the surface of the field. Analytical chemistry is one of the biggest areas of chemistry because it gets information about the world. And thus, it's critical for making informed decisions. It's also not nearly as glamorous as the other fields. Your whole objective is not to make a product or make something happen, but to get data. Most of the time, just a single number. So, not glamorous at all. For many chemists, it's the chemistry equivalent of flipping burgers. But at least you don't have to deal with unruly customers. So I have here a bottle of so-called oxygen bleach. It's actually hydrogen peroxide and is advertised as an eco-friendly or milder alternative to chlorine bleach. For amateur chemists like us, this is a cheap and readily available source of hydrogen peroxide. Unfortunately, this bottle doesn't list its concentration anywhere, and without that its usefulness is considerably diminished. Even worse is that this bottle is a bit old, so it probably decayed in storage. Even if it listed the manufactured concentration, we don't know what it is after the decay. So we need a way to determine what the current concentration is. The most direct way of doing so is to react the hydrogen peroxide with something of known concentration, and when all the hydrogen peroxide is reacted, if we know how much of the reactant was used, we can then calculate how much of the hydrogen peroxide it reacted with. And that's the concept of titration. We have our sample under study, the analyte, and we react it with a reactant or titrant. Now it's very important that we have some type of indication when the reaction completes. Otherwise, we might add too much and never know. So usually analytical chemists will add a small amount of indicator compound to the mixture that changes color when the reaction completes. Alternatively, we can also use electronic means like pH electrodes or oxidation reduction potential electrodes. For hydrogen peroxide, we're going to use a very convenient titrant that's also an indicator, potassium permanganate. Under acidic conditions, potassium permanganate reacts very cleanly and completely with hydrogen peroxide. And being strongly colored, after it reacts, it will linger and indicate to us that the reaction is complete. So potassium permanganate is a very convenient titrant for hydrogen peroxide. But most titrations will not be this straightforward. So let's make our reagents. First, we'll prepare our supporting titration mixture. Weigh out 100 grams of sodium bisulfate, which is a pH lowering chemical for swimming pools, and to this we add 1 liter of deionized water and stir until dissolved. I know it's a lot, but we'll need a good stock since we'll be doing multiple trials. Our objective here is to create a strongly acidic solution to support the reactions that the potassium permanganate we'll be using later. The reactions don't work all that well in alkaline media. We cannot use hydrochloric acid because hydrochloric acid is a redox active with potassium permanganate. We just want the acid activity and no redox activity. Professional analytical chemists use sulfuric acid, but most of us amateurs don't have access to a lab grade sulfuric acid. The more common drain cleaner grade sulfuric acid is too contaminated for use with analytical chemistry. So I'm using sodium bisulfate as a substitute. It's much easier to get and pure enough for our purposes. Don't worry about the precision of our quantities, we just need an acidic solution. I'm actually using an excess. Okay, once all that's dissolved, set it aside. Now for our titrant potassium permanganate. My source of potassium permanganate is this commercial green sand filter regenerant. For those of you who don't know, green sand filters are used by individual households to remove redox active contaminants in water like iron, manganese, and hydrogen sulfide. They're often used with well water or other naturally sourced water systems. Anyway, they are regenerated with potassium permanganate solution, and that provides us with a cheap and easy to obtain source of potassium permanganate. To make our solution, we get 25 grams of potassium permanganate and add to it 500 milliliters of deionized water. It's important we use deionized or distilled water for this whole experiment to minimize contaminants and impurities. Anyway, let's stir for an hour. Now we set both solutions aside and let them settle for a few hours. This is so any particles settle to the bottom and to release any dissolved gases. Professionals would sometimes filter the potassium permanganate to remove any particles, but I'm not going to bother for an amateur level experiment. 
Now our first test is to get a sample of the supporting titration mixture of about say 50 milliliters and add in one drop of the potassium permanganate titrant and stir. There should be a lingering pink color. What we're doing is testing if the supporting titration mixture of sodium bisulfate has any reductive impurities. If it did, for example if it had sulfide contamination, it would go clear as it reacts. If that happens to your mixture then that means your source of sodium bisulfate is contaminated and you should cancel the experiment and find another source of sodium bisulfate. Fortunately for us, my source seems good so we can continue. I tried this earlier with drain cleaner grade sulfuric acid but the test failed. So that's why I switched over to sodium bisulfate. You can see that we've barely started and we're already super paranoid about everything we do. That's the nature of analytical chemistry. You need to trust as little as possible and verify as much as you can. In this case we're verifying that our supporting titration mixture, sodium bisulfate solution, is not contaminated with reductive impurities. Okay, let me dump that out into the waste and clean everything with deionized water. And we're back. Now a problem with potassium permanganate is that it's usually not pure enough for analytical purposes. It decays in storage and my source even says right on the label that it's been cut with sodium sulfate. Therefore I absolutely cannot trust it. So how can I use this to titrate hydrogen peroxide if I'm uncertain how pure it is? We could abandon it and try another titrant, or we could determine the actual purity of our potassium permanganate. To do that we perform a titration on a standard analyte of well-known purity in chemistry and use the results to back calculate the parameters of our titrant. The process of measuring and calibrating our titrant is called standardization. To standardize potassium permanganate, we need a reference standard of high purity, stability, and simple definite chemistry. These standards are also called primary standards or analytical standards. They're kind of like calibration weights. They're an analyte of precisely known properties. For potassium permanganate, a common primary standard is sodium oxalate. And we made that in a previous video. It's convenient for the amateur since it's easy to make and purify. So let's do that with sodium oxalate. Before we begin, make sure your sodium oxalate is dry. If you're unsure, heat an oven to 200 celsius for an hour, or store it in a desiccator for a few days. It needs to be dry. So let's get started. We get a milligram scale and we calibrate it using a standard calibration weight. Every scale is different and you'll have to follow the instructions for your particular scale. We didn't need to do this for the other reagents since accuracy didn't matter. But for the primary standard we need to be as accurate and precise as possible. So calibrate the scale first before you get started for the day. Once your scale is calibrated and trustworthy, weigh out 1 gram of sodium oxalate. I'm weighing by difference. Weighing the bottle before and after I pour some of it into my reagent beaker. This big scale over here only resolves to 10 milligram increments and I'm using it just to get a rough estimate so I'm not adding blind. The milligram scale is what I'm actually recording. Now don't worry if you don't get exactly 1 gram. In fact I overshot a bit and got 1.053 grams. Record the actual value of what you got and when we perform our calculations we will be using our actual values and not our intended values. Now that we have 1 gram of sodium oxalate, we now add about 50 milliliters of our supporting titration mixture containing sodium bisulfate that we made earlier. Exact quantity is not critical, and you can just eyeball it. Now if you're wondering why the background keeps moving around and the chemicals keep changing, it's because I'm editing this video out of order. So apologies if the quantities look confusing. Pay attention to what I'm saying and just look at what I'm doing as a guide, but it might not fit exactly with what I've said. Now heat up the mixture with stirring on the hot plate to 70 degrees celsius. I'm monitoring the temperature with this digital thermometer. Sodium oxalate stability has the drawback that it reacts rather slowly with potassium permanganate. So we need to heat it up to get a good reaction rate. Now get a beaker of potassium permanganate titrant and weigh it along with the pipette. We'll be tracking how much we add by mass. After recording the starting mass in our lab notebook, we start adding the potassium permanganate to the sodium oxalate solution. This is where the titration is actually happening. The potassium permanganate is reacting with the sodium oxalate to produce sodium sulfate, potassium sulfate, manganese sulfate, and carbon dioxide. The products are very weakly colored, almost clear, so the difference is very dramatic. Keep going until we have a lingering brown or pink color. When that happens it means all the sodium oxalate has been consumed. 
For this first trial, we're just trying to get a rough estimate how much we need, so we don't need to be too precise. And it looks like we're done. Now weigh our beaker of potassium for manganate, subtract the difference, and that gives us a rough estimate of how much we need. Looks like I used about 11 grams of permanganate solution. Now we wash out our titration and do this again. But this time we're not practicing. This is a precision trial. Once again we weigh out 1 gram of sodium oxalate, but record how much we actually use. We add in our supporting titration mixture, and before we even heat up, we add in directly about 90% of our expected titrant. Since we used about 11 grams, I'm adding in about 10 grams. We're doing this to save time since we already know roughly where our endpoint is. So we just need to titrate the remaining 10%. Additionally, oxalic acid upon heating reacts very slowly with oxygen. The effect is very tiny, less than 1%, but in the interest of improving our accuracy, we react away most of it before that can happen. The remaining 1% error on the last 10% of sodium oxalate is even smaller. So now we wait until the mixture heats up to 70 Celsius, and then we continue our titration. Since this is our precision trial, we need to go carefully. Add drop by drop of potassium permanganate, and make sure the color vanishes before adding the next drop. When the color lingers and doesn't vanish, then you know you've reached the endpoint. Record how much potassium permanganate in total we've used. 10 grams was added directly, and an additional 1 gram was titrated in. I know it seems a bit odd to weigh the whole beaker of titrant and the pipette too, but this is to minimize errors from drops of titrant sticking to the pipette. If we weigh them together, then everything is accounted for. And that was our first precision trial. But to ensure accuracy, we need to do this a few more times to be sure. So I'm going to wash out the reaction beaker and reset. This is now precision trial 2, and once again we weigh out 1 gram of sodium oxalate. Just as before, we add 50 milliliters of our support titration mixture, and preload our reaction with a 90% head start of potassium permanganate. Once again, we start heating, and begin the titration when we reach 70 Celsius. Now those of you who are familiar with aerial chemistry and volumetric titrations, are probably screaming at the screen for me to titrate using a piece of lab equipment called a burette. For those of you who don't know, a barrette is basically a graduated addition funnel with extremely precise graduations to dispense known volumes of liquid. It's the mainstay of titrations, and the bane of many analytical chemistry students over the centuries. What I would do is fill it with potassium permanganate solution, and then dispense it into my reaction. It would definitely be a lot more convenient than using a pipette. Interestingly enough though, it's actually less precise. I'm using a scale with 10 milligram resolution, so it can measure about 0.01 milliliters of water difference, at least in theory. In practice, it resolves about 30 milligrams or 0.03 milliliters. But anyway, most of these barrettes resolve to about 0.01 milliliters, a larger resolution than this scale. So this crude amateur method is actually more precise than a professional analytical grade barrette. What I'm doing here is a gravimetric titration rather than the more common volumetric titration. Nonetheless, it works, although I will agree that it is rather tedious. If you're going to use a scale for titration like I am, get a scale that resolves to 10 milligrams. Scales that resolve to 0.1 milligram are not precise enough, and milligram scales don't have enough range. This beaker weighs about 150 grams, and that amount of mass overloads most milligram scales. Milligram scales that can handle that much range tend to be very expensive. Not even I have one. Looks like we're done. Once again we record our data, and we reset for one final trial. Again we weigh out 1 gram of sodium oxalate, add our supporting titration mixture, preload 90% of our expected titrant, and then start heating before doing the precision titration. Now the percentage among you will ask, how do we know we can trust the sodium oxalate? Shouldn't we try and verify that too? You're absolutely right, and this is one of the major points of trust we have as amateur analytical chemists. We need to trust that we made it correctly and that it's reasonably pure. Better than 99%. For now, we're just going to have to accept this point of trust. Professional analytical chemists don't accept that, and instead will buy primary standard with certified purity and traceable standardization all the way back to a standards lab. The whole field of analytical chemistry and metrology is pretty complicated and beyond the scope of this video, but at least now you know where to look if you want to know more.
If you want to verify the sodium oxalate yourself rather than trust a purchase and certified primary standard, you would use a type of titration called amperometric or colometric titration. That's basically an electrolytic titration and lets us verify primary standards or even replace them with electrolytic reactions. Someday I'll do them, but for now let's just focus on the classic methods. Now you might be asking, if these primary standards are so good, why aren't we using them as the titrant directly? The answer is we often do, and you can buy rigorously purified and standardized chemicals for analysis that can be weighed exactly and used directly to titrate an unknown. But not everything you analyze will have chemistry that easy. It's because a good titrant tends to be highly reactive, which is what we want to ensure a complete reaction. But because it's highly reactive, it also tends to be unstable and decay in storage. So good reactive titrants have questionable purities. Meanwhile, a good primary standard tends to be highly stable. Highly stable standards are desirable because they don't decay in storage and are easy to work with. But if they're too stable, they may not react completely with our analyte, if at all. So that's why a lot of times we will use both to complement each other. We use a highly reactive titrant that we know will completely and cleanly react with our analyte, and we standardize it to account for any decay and impurities using a highly stable primary standard. Okay, looks like this third trial is done. Now we can calculate the concentration of the potassium permanganate solution right now, but we don't have to. While we're still in the lab, we can go right to titrating the peroxide and do all of our calculations together at the end. Personally, that's what I do to save time. Now, hydrogen peroxide is very reactive, unlike sodium oxalate, so we can forego heating and set the thermometer aside. To titrate the hydrogen peroxide, we weigh out one gram of hydrogen peroxide using the milligram scale. Once again, we try to aim for one gram, but record the exact amount we actually add and use that for the calculations. We then add 50 milliliters of our supporting titration mixture of sodium bisulfate. We can now start titrating directly right at room temperature. In fact, you actually want it to remain cold so as to minimize decomposition of the hydrogen peroxide before you can titrate it. The reaction of hydrogen peroxide and potassium permanganate under acidic conditions yields manganese ions and oxygen gas. This is one of those unusual situations where hydrogen peroxide is technically behaving as a reducing agent and serves as the basis for this titration reaction. Hydrogen peroxide decomposes in the presence of transition metals like manganese ions, but under strongly acidic conditions, the decomposition proceeds very slowly. So in the several minutes it takes to titrate, the decomposition is almost negligible. You get more errors from the scale. So as long as you're not taking hours to perform this titration, the decomposition isn't an issue. And we are done. My particular peroxide just needed about 2 grams of titrant. As usual, we do 3 trials to get a good average, and make sure we didn't screw up a particular one. Let me reset. Once again, we weigh out 1 gram of hydrogen peroxide, add our supporting titration mixture, and start titrating. You'll notice I'm not using the tear function of the scale when measuring the titrant. Instead, I'm measuring the mass of the titrant, pipette, and the beaker, and subtracting the weights before and after titration. The reason why I'm not tearing the scale to zero is because the scale will sometimes power off and lose the zero tear while I work. So I prefer to record the absolute weights as a more reliable practice. You also probably noticed that in numerous instances I've been re-weighing the beakers multiple times. The problem with these very cheap domestically available scales is that they often drift or stick so the readings are not perfectly consistent. A high quality professional lab scale won't have these issues, but for these lower end scales, it helps to get multiple readings and use the consistent ones while discarding the outliers. I'm also checking if the scale goes back to zero after removing the weight. If it does, then the readings are more credible. But if the scale doesn't go back to zero, then that means it's drifting, and I need to reset or tear the scale and try again. This is why a professional analytical lab will spend thousands of dollars on high quality scales. Not necessarily to get high sub milligram resolution, but to have high reliability, linearity, and consistent readings. And there we go, that was our second trial. Now for our third trial. At this point you know the drill, so I won't repeat myself. Analytical chemistry is very methodical, mechanical, and occasionally very boring. You might be wondering if evaporation is a source of error. 
It is, but I found the evaporation rate to be less than the error on my scales. So I didn't bother to compensate for it. But if you would prefer, you can use eyedropper bottles for the tie trim to prevent evaporation. And we're finally done. Now with this data, we can start calculating our concentrations, quantities, and results. One gram of sodium oxalate corresponds to about 0.007 moles. Sodium oxalate reacts with potassium permanganate in a 5 to 2 mole ratio, where for every 5 moles of sodium oxalate react with 2 moles of potassium permanganate. So for every 1 gram of sodium oxalate, we use about 0.003 moles of potassium permanganate. I've put the exact numbers on screen. Now for each trial, we use about 11 grams of titrant solution. So dividing the amount of potassium permanganate we know we used by the mass of the titrant, we get the concentration by mass or molality of 0.290 moles per kilogram. For those of you who don't know, molality is what we chemists call the concentration expressed as moles versus mass. Most chemistry courses teach molarity, where the concentration is expressed as moles versus volume. But since we performed a gravimetric titration and measured the mass and not the volume as in a volumetric titration, we're expressing our values as molality. We run the calculation for every trial, and since there's nothing obviously wrong or blamed outlier, we average them to get our average molality. Now that we have that number, we start calculating our hydrogen peroxide concentration. It took about 2.1 grams of titrant for every trial, so if we multiply that by the molality, we get about 0.0062 moles of potassium permanganate. Now potassium permanganate reacts with hydrogen peroxide in a 5 to 2 mole ratio, so this corresponds to 0.00156 moles of hydrogen peroxide. We multiply that by the molar mass of hydrogen peroxide to get about 0.053 actual grams of hydrogen peroxide per 1 gram we added. We divide the actual grams by the amount of hydrogen peroxide added per trial, and that gives us 5.04%. We perform the same calculation for every trial, and none of them look weird, so we average them out and get 5.1% plus or minus 0.1%. And there we have it. After all that work, we finally have our actual concentration of this particular bottle of hydrogen peroxide. As you can see, it's somewhat involved, but not really all that hard. A good analytical method is easy to do and reliable, although they are unfortunately rather tedious at times. Now I want to discuss error, but you can skip this part since most amateurs don't really need to know this. Anyway, just because you get a result, that doesn't mean your result is right. And even if you perform everything correctly, there are errors in your equipment and your measurements. You'll never be perfectly right. For most amateurs, and even on professionals, the errors aren't that important. But if you're doing analytical work, you need to quantify just how much error you have so you can assess the usefulness and reliability of results. There are many cases where even large errors are acceptable, just as long as you know just how large they are. If you noticed, I expressed the final value of hydrogen peroxide as 5.1% plus or minus 0.1%. Where did I get the 0.1% from? I got that by mathematically carrying through and combining all the errors on the various input values used to calculate the resultant value. Let me explain. All physical values have an error associated with them. There are some rare exceptions, like to find constants, but let's ignore them for now. The scales I use aren't perfectly precise, and there is some error with what they measure. Because of this, anything I derive or calculate with them will also have an error. A good scale will directly tell you in its documentation the error range, but if you don't have that, you can estimate by repeatedly weighing something and seeing what range of values you get after a few dozen measurements. I found my milligram scale to have an error of about 3 milligrams, while the larger 10 milligram scale had an error of about 30 milligrams. As you can see, this error is larger than the minimal unit of the scale. Anyway, whenever I perform a mathematical operation on the input variables, I also need to somehow carry through the error of those inputs to the outputs. But I cannot simply do the exact same mathematical operation on the error as on the input. Errors must always combine, so they tend to grow the more operations you perform. Kind of like entropy. To illustrate, consider when I subtract the before and after masses of the titrant beaker. 
the error of the inputs cannot be subtracted because that would be zero and that would not make any sense. So the errors of both the input numbers are combined using special equations depending on the operation performed. For subtraction, this equation is used. As you can see, it's not simply adding or subtracting errors. Later, when we calculate the moles of oxalate we used, we perform a division operation, and to combine the errors for division, we use this equation. As you can see, it's different from the equation for subtraction. Now this is just a tiny glimpse of error propagation, and there are whole university level courses on it, so I won't get into it. I just want you to be aware that it exists and can be done mathematically to quantify the error of your results. Fortunately, there are plenty of resources online if you want to learn more. Just research the topic of error propagation or propagation of uncertainty. Now at this point I want to talk about significant figures. For any given number, there are an infinite number of digits on either side. So obviously we should only use the most significant ones. When we perform calculations, we should use all the figures we can so we can minimize the buildup of rounding and truncation errors. But when we present our numbers, we should only present the most significant figures. This is so that we don't accidentally imply we have better precision than we actually do. But how do we know how many figures to use? The general rule for chemists is to use the minimum significant figures of the initial input measurements. Since my milligram scale has about 4 significant figures, and my 10 milligram scale has 5, I can only trust up to 4 significant figures. I present 5 significant figures for my calculations, so we can minimize the accumulation of rounding intrication errors, but there is the understanding that I'm using full figures underneath. Now the final value only has two significant figures. I know this seems odd, but it's related to our error calculations. As we accumulate errors, we actually lose significant figures, and the final value should not have more significant figures than the limits of the error. The most significant figure of our error is the least significant figure of our final value. So in my case, since we calculate the error and accumulate it to the first decimal place, we need to reduce the significant figures of our final value to the first decimal place as well. And thus, I present it as 5.1% plus or minus 0.1%. Interestingly enough, error and significant figures actually help guide experimental design. You might be wondering why I picked one gram of primary standard or one gram of analyte. Why not pick one milligram and save ourselves time? It's because of error. Let's say I pick one milligram of primary standard. My milligram scale has an error of three milligrams. So carrying through the error propagation, our results would be completely and totally consumed by the error. Even if I got it right at 5.1%, the error would be plus or minus 15% or more. So to design a better experiment, I increase the amounts used to decrease the effects of errors on the results. And that's why I use quantities like 1 gram instead of 1 milligram. Now of course the question comes up that if increasing the amounts decreases the error, why not go to the extreme and use the maximum amounts our scales can measure? The biggest issue is cost. A high quality certified and traceable standard reference material will absolutely bankrupt your lab if you use the maximum amount for every trial. Although you won't get that far as your lab supervisor will probably bury you first. Another issue is convenience. You don't want to be titrating a kilogram of chemical for hours. A secondary but much more subtle problem is that as you approach the upper ranges of your equipment, you start to encounter nonlinear effects and your errors start increasing again. But the most insidious part is that you might not realize it's happening. Your scale looks like it's working, but the numbers it gives might have an additional drift away from the actual value. Finally, if you go near the limits of your equipment, you might start bending and wearing it out. Putting the maximum weight on a scale repeatedly is not good for its long-term stability. Okay, so the last thing I want to discuss is a very tiny and subtle point about experimental design. If you noticed, I calibrated the milligram scale using a standard mass, but I didn't bother calibrating the larger 10 milligram scale. Now for things like the sodium bisulfate, it doesn't matter since I'm using an excess anyway. But during the titrations, I was measuring the titrant itself. This has to be done precisely. So why didn't I calibrate it? The easy answer is that this is an amateur level experiment, so it doesn't matter. But even professionals won't bother for this particular part. And that's because the math actually makes the calibration irrelevant. 
During the standardization step we find the concentration of the titrant, but during the analysis step we use that concentration and convert to moles of analyte. Any systemic calibration errors introduced in the standardization step actually divide out again in the analysis step. So this scale can be completely and totally wrong. As long as it's properly zeroed and maintains a linear response, it doesn't matter if it's wrong. It can be giving results in pounds as far as I care, and it still mathematically cancels out. Just as long as I use the same scale for both the standardization and analysis steps. And that's one of the key parts of analytical method design. By being aware of how the math, the chemistry, and the machinery interact, you can reduce your workload and improve the quality of results. Now when would I need to calibrate the 10 mg scale? If I was going to later use the titrant with a different scale or in a different experiment and needed to transfer the calibration data. Right now the math only cancels out if I use the same scale with the same titrant. As you can see you really need to know how your stuff interacts to take advantage of tricks like this. So that's a brief rundown of error propagation, significant figures, and experimental design. Now before the actual scientists and mathematicians eviscerate me in the comments, what I presented is a very rough crash course on the subject. There's actually a lot of subtlety and nuance that I've completely steamrolled over. If you want to know more, look up error analysis and statistics. I'll be honest, I did not do very well in those courses, so feel free to eviscerate me in the comments after all. So that was how we determined the concentration of this commercial hydrogen peroxide based oxygen bleach using permanganate titration and found the value to be 5.1% plus or minus 0.1%. It was probably higher when I bought it and it decayed down to 5.1%. So I hope this video was useful for you. Permanganate titrations are a little easier than other titrations since the permanganate itself serves as an indicator as well as a titrant. In the future I intend to do other titrations and perform additional analytical chemistry experiments. Are there any particular substances you are interested in testing and quantifying? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon for making these science videos possible with their donations and their direction. If you're not currently a patron but would like to support the continued production of science videos like this one, then check out my Patreon page here or in the video description. I really appreciate any and all support.